I need to read it because it is a, a very beautiful vignette about a first-rate spiritual teacher, right? I mean first-rate. Uh, I'm third-rate at best. So I want you to hear from the best so you know that what I'm talking about is true, okay? So I want to give a testimonial that, it, that a lot of people don't know about because it was written by Yogananda uh, in the first edition of Autobiography of a Yogi, but it was removed from some later editions. You check that out. I want to see if it was removed from that. I think it was. I think it was Bodlerized, where they left out a, a certain uh, important passage of this chapter. So if, if you would not be bored by hearing me read uh, something by Yogananda uh, about Ananda Maima, which I think is maybe the best vignette about her that I've read. I don't think uh, it's very impressive what her own disciples have written, particularly compared to uh, what I think is in these few pages. So uh, I would like to, um, to, to read it in the context of, of it being an exemplification of the Heart Sutra's teaching, okay? And you'll remember that teaching, no memory, no consciousness, right? No perception, uh, right? All of that. Uh, that sense of disappearance. Okay. So this is the, the edition, the 1946 edition. It, you can get it now, but you, you have to make sure you ask for the original edition uh, that's unaltered. And I, I may read the whole chapters. Chapter 45, uh, entitled The Bengali Joy Permeated Mother. Okay? So, how many people have read this? Has anybody here read this? You have? Okay. Okay. Yes? You've read this chapter? You remember it? Okay. It's very powerful, yes? Okay. You don't mind hearing it again? Okay. Uh, quotes, Sir, please do not leave India without a glimpse of Nirmala Devi. Her sanctity is intense. She is known far and wide as Ananda Maima. This is my niece, Ami Obos, speaking, who gazed at me earnestly. Right, this is Yogananda speaking. Uh, of course I want very much to see the woman saint, I added. I have read uh, of her advanced state of God realization. A little article appeared about her years ago in East-West. Okay. Well, I have met her, the, the, uh, the niece went on. She recently visited my own little town of Jamshedpur. At the entreaty of a disciple, Anandamai Ma went to the home of a dying man. She stood by his bedside. As her hand touched his forehead, his death rattle ceased. The disease vanished at once. The man, to the man's glad astonishment, he was well. Okay, not bad. <laughs> a few days later, I heard that the blissful mother was staying at the home of a disciple in the Bhavanipur section of Calcutta. Mr. Wright and I set out immediately from my father's Calcutta home. As the Ford neared the Bhavanipur house, my companion and I observed an unusual street scene. Anandamai Ma was standing in an open-topped automobile, blessing a throng of about a hundred disciples. She was evidently on the point of departure. Mr. Wright parked the Ford some distance away and accompanied me on foot toward the quiet assemblage. The woman saint glanced in our direction. She alit from her car and walked toward us. Father, you have come. With these fervent words, she put her arm around my neck and her head on my shoulder. Mr. Wright, remember, remember that, she hugs him, okay? Uh, uh, who, to whom I had just uh, remarked that I did not know this woman, was hugely enjoying this extraordinary demonstration of welcome. <laughs> the eyes of the 100 Chellas, her disciples, were also fixed with some surprise uh, about, with this affectionate tableau. I had instantly seen that the saint was in a high state of samadhi, indeed. Utterly oblivious to her outward garb as a woman, 
She knew herself as the changeless soul. From that plane, she was joyously greeting another devotee of God. She led me by the hand, by the hand, into her automobile. Ananda Mai Ma, I am delaying your journey, I protested. Father, I am meeting you for the first time in this life after ages. Please do not leave yet. We sat together in the rear seat of the car. The blissful mother soon entered the immobile, ecstatic state. Her beautiful eyes glanced heavenward and half opened became stilled, gazing into the near or far inner Elysium. Now remember Elysium, very interesting word. The disciples chanted gently, Jai, victory to Mother Divine. So they're all sitting around the car, you know, watching these two in the back seat. Uh, she's going into bliss. Where's her husband? <clears throat> okay. Uh, I had found many men of God realization in India, but never before had I met such an exalted woman saint. Her gentle face was burnished with the ineffable joy that had given her the name of Blissful Mother. Long black tresses lay loosely behind her unveiled head. Unveiled. A red dot of sandalwood paste on her forehead symbolized the spiritual eye ever open within her. Tiny face, tiny hands, tiny feet, a contrast to her spiritual magnitude. Ha. I put some questions to a nearby woman, Chela, while Ananda Mai Ma remained entranced, right? <laughs> He's not, she's not going to talk to him anymore, right? Uh, she's, she's already with the real father here. Okay, uh, and then the Chela told me the Blissful Mother travels widely in India. In many parts, she has hundreds of disciples. Her courageous efforts have brought about many desirable social reforms, right? Here's the ideological background. Although a Brahmin, you know, the saint recognizes no caste distinctions, a group of us always travel with her looking after her comforts. We have to mother her. She takes no notice of her body. If no one gave her food, she wouldn't eat. She wouldn't make any inquiries. Even when meals are placed before her, she doesn't touch them. To prevent her disappearance from this world, we disciples feed her with our own hands. She wants to disappear. For days together, she's already disappeared, right? For days together, she often stays in the divine trance, scarcely breathing, her eyes unwinking. One of her chief disciples is her husband. Many years ago, soon after their marriage, he took a vow of silence. Interesting. The cella pointed to a broad-shouldered, fine-featured man with long hair and hoary beard. He had a huge beard. Uh, he was standing quietly in the midst of the gathering, his hands folded in a disciple's reverential attitude. This, by the way, is going to answer the question that was asked before about what happens to love relationships when you get to higher chakras. Okay. Refreshed by her dip in the infinite, meaning her <laughs> trans, Ananda Ma was now focusing her consciousness again on the material world. Father, please tell me where you stay. Where, what, 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 what is she really asking? Where does he stay? Which assemblage point? <clears throat> Her voice was clear and melodious. At present in Calcutta or Ranchi, but soon I shall be returning to America. America? <laughs> yes. An Indian woman saint would be sincerely appreciated there by the spiritual seekers. Would you like to go? <laughs> if Father can take me, I will go. The reply immediately caused her nearby disciples to start in alarm. <laughs> and uh, suddenly one of them says firmly, 20 or more of us always travel with the blissful mother. We could not live without her. 
Wherever she goes, we must go. Reluctantly, I abandon the plan as possessing an impractical feature of spontaneous enlargement. Okay, very important concept, right? Isn't that really what's happening now, a spontaneous enlargement? Okay, <clears throat> please come at least to Ranchi with your disciples, I said on taking leave of the saint. As a divine child yourself, you will enjoy the little ones in my school. And she says, wherever Father takes me, I will gladly go. A short time later, <clears throat> the Ranchi Vidyalaya, which is a school, was in gala array for the saint's promised visit. The youngsters looked forward to any day of festivity because there would be no lessons, hours of music, a feast for the climax. Victory! Anandamai ma kijai! This reiterated chant from scores of enthusiastic little throats greeted the saint's party as it entered the school gates. Showers of marigolds, tinkle of cymbals, lusty blowing of conch shells, and beat of the mridanga drum. The blissful mother wandered smilingly over the sunny Vidyalaya grounds, ever carrying with her her portable paradise. Very interesting concept. It's beautiful here, Ananda Maima said graciously as I led her into the main building. And she seated herself with a childlike smile by my side. The closest of dear friends she made one feel. Yet an aura of remoteness was ever around her. The paradoxical isolation of omnipresence. Please, Tell me something of your life, Ananda asks her. <clears throat> Father knows all about it, she says. Why repeat it? She evidently felt <clears throat> that the factual history of one short incarnation was beneath notice. Is she really incarnate? I laughed, gently repeating my question. And, and Ananda Maima says, Father, there's little to tell. She spread her graceful hands in a deprecatory gesture. My consciousness has never associated itself with a temporary body. Before I came on this earth, Father, I was the same. As a little girl, I was the same. I grew into womanhood, but still, I was the same. When the family in which I had been born <clears throat> made arrangements to have this body married, I was the same. And when, passion drunk, my husband came to me and murmured endearing words, lightly touching my body, he received a violent shock as if struck by lightning. For even then, I was the same. My husband knelt before me, folded his hands, and implored my pardon. Mother, he said, because I have desecrated your bodily temple by touching it with the thought of lust, not knowing that within it dwelt not my wife, but the Divine Mother. I take this solemn vow. I shall be your disciple, a celibate follower ever caring for you in silence as a servant, never speaking to anyone again as long as I live. May I thus atone for the sin I have today committed against you, my guru. It's not easy marrying a saint. <clears throat> Even when I quietly accepted this proposal of my husband's, says Ananda Maima, I was the same. And Father, in front of you now, I am the same. And ever afterward, though the dance of creation change around me in the hall of eternity, I shall be the same. Principle of sameness embodied perfectly. 
Ananda, my ma, sank into a deep meditative state. Her form was statue still. Was that in the other edition? No, you see, they removed it. <laughs> Ethically wrong, right? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Political, that's politics. Can you believe that? In spirituality, they would politically uh, leave that out. I won't even speculate as to the reasons. Okay, her form was statue still. She had fled to her ever-calling kingdom. Her kingdom, yes. Not his. The dark pools of her eyes appeared lifeless and glassy. This expression is often present when saints remove their consciousness from the physical body, which is then hardly more than a piece of soulless clay. We sat together for an hour in the ecstatic trance. She returned to this world with a gay little laugh. Okay, I think I, I will leave the reading off there. Uh, but uh, it ends up as she says finally goodbye to him on the train. She's going to the Himalayas. Behold, now and always, one with the eternal, I am ever the same. <laughs>